We all ask questions. Are eyebrows considered facial hair? I've always wondered, do vegetarians eat animal crackers? If a number two pencil's so popular, why is it still number two? Do bald people get dandruff? Why are power outages reported on TV? That makes no sense. But some questions are more meaningful than others. How do I handle all the stress in my life? How do I discover God's will for my life and live it out every day? I have a hard time dealing with disappointment. What does the Bible say I should do? How can I be the parent my kids need me to be and the one God wants me to be? What does the Bible say about dealing with difficult people? Because I know some. Are we actually living in the end times? What does that mean for me? So we turn to the one who has all the answers. We'll examine some of our biggest questions and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. All right, today we are on our last leg of our new our series called You Asked For It. And you asked for it in case you're wondering why are you calling it You Asked For It. Well, we had a survey on Easter where everyone, pretty, pretty much on Easter, everyone comes out to church that day. So we figured, what a great time to have a survey. So we gave a survey and we asked you a bunch of questions. And one of the questions he asked you, what are some things you'd like to hear about? And so what we've been doing over the last six weeks is asking the questions about what you asked for. Well, this final one is, um, how are we living in the end times? And I'm tempted to do a part two on this because there's so much information I want to just, uh, about what's going on in the end times. So, so that's today. We're ending uh, the series most likely today. And, and we might put an addendum on it. I'm not quite sure, unless you want to stay here all day. Okay, I didn't think so. All right, so question is, are we living in the last days? I'm going to say something that might be shocking to you this morning. I'm going to make a prediction that today we are closer to the second coming of Christ than ever before. I can honestly say that. I'm a prophet. You didn't know it. Uh, but anyhow, yes, we, I believe we are living in the last days. Of course, the church has been thinking that for 2,000 years. The apostle Paul thought he was in the last days. The churches thought they were in the last days. Peter thought he was in the last days. In fact, it got so bad. People got so like, well, he's coming back, so why work? So there was a, a church in um, Thessalonica who decided, I don't want to work. And Paul said, hey, if you don't work, you don't eat. So there came a point where the church really thought he was going to come back any, any moment. In fact, when Jesus came back from the dead, the disciples said, oh, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? It says in Acts chapter 1. It says, not for you to know the time, the epochs that the Father has set in heaven, but this is what you shall do. You shall go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other parts of the world. So Jesus basically told us right off the bat, I mean, the first question the early church asked him, when are you coming back? And he says, not for you to know the times, but this is what you're called to do. Well, let me just stop there for a moment and mention something really quickly to you all this morning is this. It's very easy for us to get distracted with end times prophecy to such a degree that it makes us immobilized in doing what we're called to do. That's counterproductive. However, we should know the times and we should know the seasons. And I recognize this morning that some of you have differing, differing views. And so we're not going to, you know, some of you like certain Bible teachers and you like certain books you've read, Left Behind series, whatever it is. We're not going to get into all that. What we're going to look at is the, is the things that are very obvious in biblical prophecy today. And I, I believe today you're going to come away with a, a more sobering ob, um, idea of what's happening. So it's going to be more of a heavy sermon than normal. But I encourage you to listen up, because I believe God is going to do some great things in our world in the near future. And I do believe, I personally believe, that we are entering, uh, if not the end of the end. And I'll show you why I believe such, and I think the, the scriptures will sustain what I'm saying. However, I will give no predictions, though I might give one or two. I'm just kidding with you. How many remember 88 Reasons in 1988, right? Let me make something very, very clear. If anyone says they know when Christ is coming back, do not believe him. Jesus says, no one knows the hour or the time, only the Father who is in heaven. So the moment someone says, I know, write them off completely. They do not know because Jesus said no one knows. Even Jesus didn't know at the time. All right, does that make clear, everybody? Okay. So let's go ahead forward. I'm going to make another disclaimer. No matter what your view is, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, amillennialism, no-trib, pan-theory, whatever, whatever your theory is, it all ends the same. Christ comes back and makes it all right. 
So we had that in common. All right, everybody? So I'm not going to um, get involved with all the different theories that are out there. Let's just focus on what is absolutely evident and obvious. And that's what we're going to do today. So I do believe we're in the end times and several different reasons. Have you seen the rise of anti-Semitic movements in the world today? It's absolutely astounding what's beginning to happen. We have a nation of Iran, uh, not the Iranians, but the Iranian government, which it has um, radical Islam, wants to wipe Israel off the map and has, I quote the leaders, we want to turn the Mediterranean to blood with the blood of um, Israelites. So this is stuff that they said. Okay, this is what's going on. And we, we can also see that the different countries, including our own country, is getting a little anti-Semitic. And I'll share with that a little bit later on. That's happening globally. We also see that the world economy is really quite shaky. So what happened in Greece? You see what's happening around the world. The economy is really shaky. Do you realize we just signed a two-year budget deal that will give us the ability to go up more money. We have $18 trillion of debt. Again, I, just to give me a little pause here, I'm not gonna get into politics, I'm just stating the, what's going on. We have $18 trillion of debt and they project we'll be up to 20 in no time. It's astounding. You cannot sustain a country or a household with that kind of budget. And you just can't sustain it. If your expenses are $80,000 a year and you're making 50, can you sustain that for very long? No. And that's what's going on with our country, unfortunately. Now, I want to say a little side note about that is this. You know what has happened in the past when countries got in trouble like that? You know what they used to do? Start wars. Get, them, get themselves out of debt. This has happened historically. Can it happen again? I don't know. But we see that happening. We also see the threat of world terrorism. In fact, there's more persecution in the church today than there ever has been since the birth of the church. And the reason for that is simply this. There's more people living today, right now, than all of history combined. There's more people on the planet today than ever before in the history of mankind. And there is a growing, um, there's growing discrimination and there's growing persecution among Christians today. We have a group right over here from Iran, Gomahadis, that they actually had to flee their country because of their faith. And I was just talking to their former pastor had to flee the country. They closed the church down. And people die and are killed. And it's amazing the things that are going on. In China, they're tearing down crosses off of buildings and they're starting to close down churches. They're starting to tighten their grip. Even in India, we start seeing some of these different groups uh, of uh, Hinduism, these radical groups of Hinduism are also persecuting Christians. And we see the Christians being beheaded. So this is happening more and more and more. And just because it happens across the sea doesn't mean it should not concern us. It should concern us. The Bible says, pray for your brothers and sisters that are being persecuted. So we should be very much akin and aware, aware of what's going on with the body of Christ. And we should be praying for the persecuted church. In fact, we're going to have persecuted church Sundays coming up. We'll be talking more about it then. So the interesting part is the Bible talks a lot about prophecy. You know that 30% of the Bible talks about prophecy? 30% of the Bible. And out of the approximately 25, excuse me, my voice is getting given out a little bit today. Out of the 2,500 prophecies in the Bible, 2,000 of them have already transpired. About 500 or so left. And the odds of all these prophecies happening as they did. For example, when Christ came, the prophecies about how he died on the cross found in Isaiah 53. I mean, all these prophecies is absolutely astounding. Mathematical probability of that happening is extraordinary. It's um, chance. All of them, by the way, 2,000 of them happened. And the probability is one in 10 to 2,000 zeros at the end of 10. Can you imagine? That's the probability of having all those things happen. No other script, no other book, no other world religion comes even close to Christianity in, as far as its truth and prophecy. So the Bible talks a lot about that. And the Bible actually says more about the final generation than any other prophecies in the Bible. The question is, are we the final generation? Well, every single Christian group throughout the 22,000 years has thought they're the end times people. 
However, there are things going on right now in our time that has never happened before and prophecies have come true that are extraordinary. You're gonna be shocked. Maybe some of you never heard it before. I will share with you in a few moments. So the Bible has a lot to say about the final generation. And Jesus said the following. In fact, unless a time of calamity was shortened, no one would survive. Can you see what's happening? It's almost like a chess match. If you're watching someone to play chess and you not kind of see what's going on, there's a checkmate ready to happen to close out the game. And so the Jesus has a lot to say about it. But remember, the only one who can foretell the future is he who designed the future, and that's God. He's the only one that knows exactly what's going to happen. And the only book in the world that foretells the future is the Bible. And it has been absolutely accurate to this point, and it continue will be. <coughs> Other people can say, <laughs> excuse me, go ahead and cough. And have you noticed when you cough, you want to cough along with everybody? Go ahead. <laughs> cough for me. Um, <clears throat> You see, the reason we have a book that foretells the future is our God controls the future. Thousands of years ago, he told us every detail of how it was going to end, and it's coming now. And we cannot talk about the end times without bringing Israel into the middle of it all. Because when you see in the Bible, it all began in that era of the world, and it's going to end in the Middle East. And it didn't take a geopolitical genius to see that the turmoil in the world that is irreconcilable is in the Middle East. Every day, you have people killing each other in the Middle East, in particular, what's going on in Israel with the Palestinians and the surrounding nations that are Islamic, radical Islamic nations that are surrounding them. So you can't get any difference. Now, what's the difference now is that Israel now is fulfilling prophetic things that were spoken about 2,500 years ago as happening. It happened and is happening. Therefore, the things that are taking place never happened before, and that's why we are unique in the area of our eschatology and what's happening right now. For example, and the rebirth of Israel in 1948, after Hitler and the Nazi party exterminated six million Jews, there was tremendous sympathy at that moment and that period of time where God turned the hearts of men to literally give them a nation called Israel. It was a miracle. It happened in one day. No one saw that coming. And so let me go ahead and share some facts about Israel. First of all, they're the only nation that was created by God. Now, there's all nations, that are, but actually God chose Israel. Let me just step back here for a moment and give you a little bit of understanding why Israel is important. Imagine this. Imagine you had children. Imagine that you were waiting to have a child, and you had your firstborn son after a long time waiting. And you loved this son very much. You did everything you could, getting the best education, spent money on him. You did all these wonderful things for him. And then you had a second child about 10 years later. So you have one, a firstborn that's 10 years older than the other. Then when your oldest 21-year-old, he decides, you know what, I don't want you anymore. He goes off the deep end, starts taking drugs, and starts getting involved with crime and all that. The next thing you know, you're heard, he's on Skid Row in L.A. And he's just a wreck, he's involved with drugs and all kinds of things. And you're heartbroken. I mean, every time you go to a family gathering, you think about your son. Every time you go to a wedding or a funeral, you think about your son. They have the holidays. Imagine that. And imagine you had other kids. You had a couple other children after him that were 10, 15 years younger than he was. How would you feel if your children said, ah, forget about him, he's a jerk. Dad, forget about him. We're more important than him. Forget about him. How would you feel as a parent? You'd be heartbroken. Why? It's your firstborn. There's something special about the firstborn because it's your first experience being a parent, right? Now imagine that. Now imagine one of your other children say, hey, Dad, I know how much you love Johnny. And we know that Johnny is, has fallen away. Dad, I really want to go after him. Dad, I, I want to fly to L.A. I want to go on Skid Row. I'm going to go on the streets, and I'm going to find him. And I'm going to do all I can to, to bring him back to you. How would you feel as a parent? I don't know about you, but i get out the checkbook and say, how much do you need? I'd write a check, wouldn't you? Well, in the same way, God's firstborn has gone wayward and left. And God wants to restore them and loves them. And we are the second, third, fourth, we come after. And it should be our position to go after the Father's heart, to reach the Jewish people. All right, this is all part of it. 
So number one, they're the only nation created by God. There's never been another nation like that before. In fact, Israel's existence today is a testimony of that. And because of Israel, God used one family to bring the revelation of him to the whole world. He chose an example, made a case study an example. Let's go ahead and look at Genesis 12, 1 through 2. I'm reading from the uh, NLT right now. You can follow along on the screen or your Bibles. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you, I will make you into a great ethne, nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. So they are, second point I want to bring to your attention, they're on an everlasting covenant or an agreement with God. Genesis 17, five through eight, just just stick with me, I know there's a lot of scripture, but I gotta show these things, okay? What's more, I'm changing your name, God said to Abraham. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you'll be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations, and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is a temporary covenant. Is that what it says? No. This is an everlasting covenant. You know what it means, everlasting in Hebrew? It means it's ever. Lasting, doesn't stop. I will always be your God and the gods of your descendants after you. I will give the entire land of Canaan where you live as a foreigner and your descendants. I will be their possession forever. I will be their God. You know what's so amazing about these scriptures? I just read these two passages of scriptures in Genesis, which by the way, the author was Moses. Moses wrote this prior to Israel ever having kings. He prophesied and this stuff happened. It's amazing. So when you say the word Israel, it is not only a people, it's a land. Now, let me just step back for a moment. I know this is a little bit touchy because there's a lot of political stuff going around about this. I'm not going to talk about the politics of it. I'm talking about what the scriptures say. All right, we're not going to get into the politics of it. But God said the people and the land belong to him according to the scriptures. Now, what's important is this. I mean, it's very important. No Jewish person has salvation unless they give their life to Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul makes this abundantly clear in the book of Romans, and it makes it very clear about that. I do not believe, and this, we do not believe in replacement theology. Replacement theology basically means that the Jewish people had their time, they passed over to us, they're irrelevant now. No, we don't believe that. We believe they're the firstborn, God loves them. But like us, they have to give their life to Christ. But nevertheless, it's still his child, and he's looking for that child to be reconciled to him, that whole nation of people. Some of you may say that. I may also say something else. God loves Arab and Persian people. Absolutely. We saw what happened with Hagar when she ran away, and uh, Ishmael. God says, I'll make you a great nation. I care about you. This is prior to Islam becoming a religion. That hadn't happened to the 7th century A.D., so, that's important. No one is saved or has a, has a relationship with Christ forever unless they give their life to Christ. He's the way. So, we need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, but there is no peace without the Prince of Peace. I mean, it is, it is a mess. Every commentator is like, just throws their hands up, doesn't know what to say about the Middle East and how to deal with that. So, that's another. Israel and the Jews have blessed the world more than any other people group in the history of mankind. I'm gonna show you what I believe to be the case. They bless the world more than any other people group. Well, how's that? Well, you'll see in a few moments. First of all, it says this in Genesis 12, three. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who treat you with contempt. All families of the earth will be blessed through you. You know what the three major gifts that they've given us, the Jewish people? The first thing they gave us was the greatest man that ever walked the planet before, called the Son of Man and the Son of God, Yeshua, which is Jesus. Let me say something else about Jesus. I hope you don't realize. Jesus was not a Jew. Jesus is Jew, Jewish, even right now. He wasn't a Jew and became un-Jew. Jesus is a Jew even now. Let me say it again. He wasn't a Jewish person. He is a Jew right now. 
So when you hate Jewish people, you are sticking a finger in God's eye because God, Son, Jesus is Jewish. You cannot remove it. You, cannot, you can talk all you want about it, but he was Jewish. The most impert person person. So how can a Christian be anti-Semitic? It's so diabolical and demonic. The enemy will deceive us. Have you noticed how people just don't like Jewish people? There's no, there's no rational reason why, except they're jealous. There's no rational reason why there's such hatred, except for the fact that the enemy hates God and wants to destroy God's kids. That's the first thing. They gave us Christ. The second most important thing, they gave us the most important book in human history called the Bible. Do you realize the Bible is written by Jewish people? Almost the entire Bible was written by Jewish people, by Jewish disciples. Everything was done by Jewish people, not American citizens. We're not Israel, okay? The Jewish people gave us, Jesus comes from, he's a Jew. The Bible is written by Jewish authors through the Jewish Messiah, through the Holy Spirit, okay? And the third thing, so that's what we bless the Jews. The third thing is the most important organization in history was created by the Jewish people. You know what it's called? The church. Do you realize the system we have here today has a similarity to the synagogues of the Jewish people? They're the ones that got the whole thing, church thing going. And the early church was Jewish. Okay, I hope you realize that. So we have a great debt to them. Plus, they've done tremendous other things. Talk about the contributions of science and culture. It is astounding how such a small group of people have had such profound effect upon the geopolitical, financial, entertainment, arts, agriculture. You go on and on. It's absolutely amazing. And the amazing thing is this. Israel was rebirthed in May 14, 1948. David ben Gurdon declared the restoration of the Jewish state of Israel, saying this. In order to be a realist, you must believe in miracles. Because it was absolutely took the world by complete surprise. Who has ever, and this is what it says in Isaiah 66, 8. Who has ever heard such a thing? Who has ever seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? And guess what? It was. In one day, Israel became a nation. Jerusalem in 1967, came in 1948, they had the land, but didn't have the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was considered the capital, was considered the place. In 1967, through a miraculous war, the Israelites, after fighting Jordan and other people, they got Jerusalem back. That is also significant on the prophetic calendar of events. For the Bible says, though the exact meaning of Luke 21, 24 has been debated for 2,000 years, there's still a consensus that the prophetic timeline was reestablished in the state of Israel. You know what also about, interesting about Israel? It says in Isaiah uh, 35, 1, it says this, the desert will bloom and blossom. Do you realize that today that California is in, in talks with Israel because Israel has extraordinary ability to deal with water shortages. They can, they, what they can do, I can't remember the exact process, they can take salt out of the water like no one else, and they have no problem with droughts. They know how to manage and do agriculture, and that desert area, when it was given to them in 1948, it was not in good shape. That land is, produces incredible oranges, Incredible roses, all sorts of great produce come from there. They have absolutely no problem with water shortages. They know how to deal with it. They are innovators in this area, and the world is coming to them because there's world droughts going on right now, and they're the ones that have the secret of how to do it. They know they've perfected the process, and the world is looking to them to know how to do it. This is all stuff that's factual. So Israel has done these very... Lastly... Israel is God's prophetic super sign and stopwatch. If you want to know what's going to happen in the end times, you must know what's going on in Israel because Israel tells us, according to the prophetic calendar written throughout Scripture, Daniel, Ezekiel, Re Revelation, the Gospels, Thessalonians, I mean, you, you name it, it's there. And I want to read a couple things to you here about this. Joel 2.31 
through 3, 2. It's right here, I'll read it to you. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great awesome day of the final judgment of the Lord. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For in Mount Zion in Jerusalem there shall be a deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. For behold, listen to this, in those days and that time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. Let me read that again. Behold, in those days and that time, when I bring back, when did that happen? 1948. 2,000 years went by. There was no unification of Jerusalem or Israel at that point because in AD 70, there was a guy named Titus from the Romans wiped out Israel I write out Jerusalem because they were in rebellion, and once again, they got tired of it. So we're going to overturn everything. And what happened was there was a tremendous, um, they basically liquidated uh, Jerusalem and spread out the Israelites around the world. And it's been desolate ever since until 1948. The Bible says, I'll continue to read here. I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter the judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They've also divided up my land. So when I bring them back, when, the, when they came back in 1948, something happened that never happened in the history. I believe the beginning of the end times began then. Now, God says, notice this, in those days at that time, or when I'm going to do this, this is what's going to happen. Here's what Jesus said about that time. In Luke chapter 21, verse 24. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away as captive into all nations. General Titus did that, all right? And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jerusalem has been trampled by Gentiles until, now it's not trampled by Gentiles. Now they have their own land. This is the words of Jesus, folks. Very, very significant. I want to show you a quick slide about prophetic vision. Please forgive the tremendous art skill that you're going to see in a few moments. <laughs> by the way, November's beard month, so you're not supposed to shave from the book. <laughs> that's in honor of that. All right, well, let me show you what happens. Imagine that's a prophet. He has a beard, of course. Okay, the prophet situation would be a mountain. These are mountains. It's the three mountains. He has a telescope. And what the prophet sees is the tip of the mountains, but does not see the valleys in between. So you have the situation, for example, in AD 70, when Titus basically liquidated Jerusalem. Well, you see it right then. Jesus prophesied that. So what happened? Then you have the first advent of Christ, for example, the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, all that. You have, you have the stuff that happened in Daniel's time. There was desecration in the temple back then. Then there was desecration in AD 70 once again. Desecration, they put uh, something in the temple that desecrated it. That happened again in AD 70. That was the first advent of Christ. Uh, and then it will happen again at the end times. Now, something else I want to bring to your attention is, is this. The first advent of Christ, you see, he's known as the suffering servant. He's going to restore all things, right? This is what happened. When Jesus came the first time, they thought he was going to come as a conquering king, but he didn't come as a conquering king. He came as a suffering servant to set up the time of, of him coming back as a conquering king. But the problem was the church or the Israelites in those days had it all figured out. So when Jesus did not come, the, the Messiah did not come in the way they thought he was going to come, they rejected him and put him on the cross. We have to be very careful that when Christ comes back on his workings in these last days, we don't have our little uh, eschatology chart so figured out that we're going to miss what he's doing. So you got to hold on to your eschatology loosely and look at the big picture and the things that are, indis uh, that are undisputable. All right? So this is kind of what happens with prophetic vision. Thank you so much. Glad you enjoy my artwork. Go ahead. All right, this is all part of the process what happens. Luke 21 through 32 says the following. And surely I say to you, this generation by no means will pass until all these things take place. That's confusing because, wait a minute, all these things didn't take place yet. I think he's talking about when they come back. Of course, this is my opinion, but nevertheless, the scriptures, we're not quite sure how to interpret that. 
So he wasn't talking about a generation. They all died. I believe he's talking about this generation here, the generation that sees Israel come back. Now, how long is a generation? 40 years? 60, 70 years, 80 years? Well, the Bible says in Psalm 9010, 70 years are given to us. Some even live to 80. I don't like that verse. My dad just turned 80, and I hope he lives to be 120. But, uh, but let's just say anywhere from 40 to 80 years could be a generation. So that puts, the, if it happened in 1948, that means you guys have about two years left. 2018, he's coming back. I'm joking, okay? I don't know for sure. But if you look at a generation, it could be 2018, if it was in 19, uh, 1948. Or if you think Jerusalem, that's when the, it should be tread upon by the Gentiles until the fulfillment of the Gentiles come. That happened in 1967. So tack on 60, 70, 70 or 80 years. We're going in now into 2047 or 2057. No, am I suggesting that oh, those days are actually going to come back? No, but if you think about a generation, it seems to be in that time. The Bible says you won't know the time, but you will know the season. Are we in that season? Thank you for answering the question. I am not setting dates, so I just set dates. <laughs> okay? I'm just saying that. And what happens today in Israel is absolutely amazing. End times are compressed in a period of God's eyes. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it sure is very interesting that none of this stuff has happened for 2,000 years or 2,500 years, and now we see this happening that until the time of the Gentiles. This gospel shall be preached, and then the end shall come, is another scripture, which Jesus talks about in Matthew 24, 9. Uh, he talks about, these are really encouraging. You're going to love these verses. Ready? Okay, let's read in these encouraging, these encouraging verses. Then you'll be arrested, persecuted, and killed. Look at your neighbor and say amen. And you'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Isn't that lovely? And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the, this is the most scary, one of the most scary verses in Scripture, in my opinion, is this. And the love of many will grow cold. Without love, we're nothing. When love grows cold, look out. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And here, here's the big Scripture here. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the world, the whole world, so that all nations will hear it. Then the end will come. The gospel has been preached on every single continent. But the Bible says all nations. The Greek word for nations is ethne. Ethne means people groups. If I drew a circle around Chester, there are hundreds of ethnes right here. And most, there's a translation to almost every, there's only about maybe 700 to 1,000 languages that have not been translated yet. And they're doing it so fast now because of computers. That everyone's going to have an opportunity to hear at once in the whole world. I mean, it's amazing, folks, what's happening. And Israel is that tipping point. Now, we know what's happening in the world because we have a book that foretells what's going to happen in the world. Now, people say, when's the rapture? Well, there is a rapture. The question is, when is it? Let me just tell you something. If, if I was selected by God, God said, you know, we need to, we need to get an uh, end times eschatology committee to help us figure out how we're going to do this. And if they elected me and I went up to heaven and I was around the table, and I was de determining how it was going to happen. When the vote came, which one should we do, pre, mid, or post-tribulation? I would vote <laughs> pre. and <laughs> say, hey, God, let's make it pre, okay? I like that one. That's the one I want to vote for. I hope that's the one, but we don't know for sure. In fact, it might be completely different than you think. We'll be raptured. The question is when. Now, this might just upset you. I, I, I know some people like to be told exactly how it's going to happen. I would be doing you a disservice if I did that. I don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And you need and I, both you and I, need to be ready. The rapture, when is it? Uh, and there's a message about Jesus. 
So the Bible says in Luke 21, 28, so when all these things begin to happen, stand up and look for your salvation is near. The tipping point is the ir, uh, irreversible development of what's going on in Israel. You know, it's really amazing when you begin to read about the geopolitical maneuverings of the world right now and you read Ezekiel 38, it is alarming. Let me just read some of that to you right now. I know, I know this is a lot of reading, folks, and I you know, uh, just uh, hope you had extra coffee. But uh, here we go. Look what it says in Psalm 83, four through five. Come, they say, let us wipe out Israel as a nation. We would destroy the very memory of its existence. Yes, this was their unanimous decision. That is exactly what Iran wants to do. Not the people of Iran, but the radical Islamic government that is there wants to wipe Israel off the map. Do you realize after we just signed this nuclear deal, deal with Iran, do you realize the, like a day after they said, we want to wipe out Israel? And it, it, that's amazing. And do you also realize that it's been said, it's also been said that there's been reports and Israel has been warned that if you bomb Iran, if you bomb Iran, the United States is going to fold its arms and you're on your own. Now, I don't know if that, that, that's been reported that by, I don't want to get into all the different politics and who said it, but I can show you something I'm not going to get into right now, but that's pretty scary. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. We, and, and you know what the amazing thing is? Let's just put aside Judaism. Let's put aside Christianity. Okay, let's just suppose we're atheist country, but we value a democracy and freedom of thought and freedom of expression. I mean, there's more, I mean, women are treated like trash in a lot of those countries. I mean, it's horrible how people are treated in those countries. They're killed, right? It's horrible. Now, imagine that. Imagine there's a country where they kill people and they threaten people and, and they're not democratic, but they are a religious fanaticism. Why would you support that when you have a democracy that gives rights to individuals, right? It doesn't make any sense. This is why I believe there's a delusion that is beyond the normal scope of rationality and it reaches into the spiritual, I believe, the delusion of the enemy. So here we have, why would you do that? I mean, you have the Palestinians don't even recognize Israel. Don't even recognize them. And the United Nations have, have given more reprimand, have, have slapped the wrist of Israel more than any other country. They're constantly lecturing Israel. Okay, it is, it just, it's just the truth of the matter. So why would we, we want to support a, uh, and, and go against a democracy and go to a theocracy? It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. So what does Ezekiel say? Well, I'm going to go ahead and read a part of this. In Ezekiel 38, 1 through 9, there's another message that came to me from the Lord. It's Ezekiel speaking, by the way, 2,500 years before this happened. Son of man, turn and face Gog and the land of Magog, the prince who rules over the nations of Mehish and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. Gog, I am your enemy. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with your whole army, your horses and charioteers in full armor and a great hard arm with shields and swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya will join you too with their weapons. Gomer and all its armies will also join you along with the armies of Beth to Hamagra, again, if I said it correctly, and those from a different north and many others. Get ready, be prepared, keep all the armies around you mobilized and take command. A long time from now, a long time from now, he says. It's been a long time since then. You'll be called into action. In the distant future, you will swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war and after its people have been returned from many lands. When are the people returned from many lands? 1948. You and all your allies and vast, awesome army will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. Now, the prophecy about this big war has not happened yet. But you look at the chessboard of the Middle East, and I'm going to just show you a couple of countries here and what's going on here. It's very interesting. Let's look at the major players in this section here. Gog and Magog. According to Joseph, Jophesus, who is a historian, that would mean Russia. The Scythians, which would be Russia. So Russia is Gog and Magog, geographically speaking. Persia, 
Iran was not called Iran until 1935. Before that, it was called Persia. I don't know if you realize that. Okay, that's Persia's involved with it. How many people see, you see Russia and Gog and Magog and, and, uh, and Persia, which is Iran, are joining together. Uh, Russia is helping Iran to make atomic energy when they have more oil than they know what to do with. They don't even need that, do they? So Russia is helping them out. Okay, Gog and Magog is helping out Persia. Ethiopia, which would be Kush, Sudan, we see radical Islam now happening in those areas where they hate Jerusalem, they hate Jewish people. How about Libya, which we put? Libya and Algeria is becoming more radicalized as well. Even Gomer, which is modern day Turkey, now is getting more and more anti-Semitic as well. Now, as far as the Central Asia, we're not quite sure, it's still open to debate, but you can see the players, the geopolitical table is being set and was prophesied thousands of years prior which is absolutely amazing. So Russia is doing these types of things. And Russia said, if I, I don't know, I, this is one of these reports you hear, I, I should verify, you need to be careful what you read on the internet, by the way, but it's interesting what happened. Because you know what Saddam Hussein was, was um, bombed by Israel when he started to try to build a nuclear facility, they bombed him. And I told you, reports now are saying if Israel, according to this Iran deal, if, if, America, if Israel bombs Iran, America's going to fold its arms, according to the Secretary of State. Um, I'm not making this stuff up, folks. Okay? I'm just not being political. I'm just talking what's happening. George W. Bush made some bad choices in the Middle East as well. So we're not just in a Republican-Democrat thing. This is just wrong decisions, in, my, in our opinion, based upon Scripture. So, um, you know, we're changing our policy towards them. We now have ISIS in the Middle East. So isn't it interesting that this book was written 2,500 years ago foretelling the geopolitical situation? And very interesting, Islam wasn't even in existence back then, until this, like I said earlier, until the 7th century AD. So this is Gog and Magog. When is this stuff going to happen? When is this going to take place? Well, this is, what I, this, this is what could happen. And I don't want to get on this too much, but what happened if Israel says, you know what, we, not, he says, we can't stand around and do nothing. Suppose they bomb Iran, right? Like they said, do Iran. And the United States says, I'm sorry, we signed that deal, We're not, you're on your own. And what happened to Russia and other countries started about, what would happen then? We're talking about a world war taking place. Listen, the Middle East is extremely volatile. It is a powder keg of dynamite. And all it takes is one spark and the whole thing could erupt. Am I saying that's gonna happen? I don't know. But my goodness, is the table not set? Is it not? You, can you see the checkmate that's about ready to happen? So what are we supposed to do about all this kind of thing? Well, Daniel talks about this very thing. He talks about the Antichrist. In, in, in Daniel 9, 27, it says this, the ruler, which is like the Antichrist, will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven, but a half a time he'll put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. So we can go on. And I, I, I'm just gonna, I was going to tell you so much more stuff. I might do a part two. You like a part two? Next year, next year, next year. It's supposed to start a new series, but anyhow. Um, yeah, a lot of pressure. I just want to, I want to just read what Jesus had to say, okay? You can't go wrong with Jesus, ever go wrong with Jesus. Thank you. My stomach's bothering me. I can't take my time. <laughs> the day is coming. This is Matthew 24, 15. The day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet said the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. That happened, by the way, in AD 70. But remember I showed you a prophetic vision. It's going to happen again. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of the roof must not go down in the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will be in winter, not on the Sabbath. A lot of scholars believe this happened in AD 70, and it did. But now Jesus begins to talk beyond 8070. He says, For there'll be greater anguish than any other time since the world began. When, that didn't happen in 8070. And it will, be ne it will never again be so great. That has not happened in 8070. Jesus is talking beyond that. In fact, unless that time of calamity was shortened, not a single person would survive. But it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. Now that's pretty sobering, is it not? 
So what's going to happen? Are we going to go through the tribulation? Well, let me ask you a question. For those Christians that were beheaded, uh, you think they've been through the tribulation a little bit? I think so. What we're talking about here is the wrath of God being poured out on people. But there's people right now that are being persecuted. And just because, I, I hate to say this, I, I can say this because I'm an American, but we don't like to suffer in America. So we like, give me the, give me the listen, I pray it happens. I pray, I pray right now, poof, we're gone. I would love it. But what happens if you and I have to go through persecution? What happens if they start rounding us up and saying that we're causing dis disruption in the government and that we're instigators, start making up stories like, ask the Gamahadis. You know what happens to the Gamahadis? They say, well, you're causing problems to the pastor or something like that. They'll arrest somebody. And you know what will happen to that person? The person gets in a mysterious auto accident. We don't know what happened. Or as I talked to um, Sam Gamahadi about it, he said that, that they said to the pastor of the church, well, you can go ahead and have church, but we can't protect you if someone comes in and blows it up. That kind of persecution, it can happen. To make no mistake, that can happen here in the United States of America. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to occupy till he returns. You and I should be salt and light and make a difference in this world. We're not supposed to bunker down and wait for him to come back. We're supposed to preach the gospel, be a blessing to wherever we go. Why are we building a children's center for? Because we want to reach more kids than we ever have. Why do we build this church? Because I believe it's going to be filled multiple, multiple times on Sundays and Saturdays. I believe we're going to have thousands come here. Why? Because people need to know that Jesus is coming back soon. This is not a country club. We're in, we're in peace right now, but can you not see what's happening, folks? I mean, it's absolutely astounding. This is a tribulation going to be coming. When is it going to happen? Is it pre, mid, post? I don't know. I hope it's pre. Please, God, let it be pre. Don't be fooled, Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4 says. Don't be fooled by what they say, for the day will not come until the great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The one who brings destruction, he will exalt himself and defy everything people call God. And then the world erupts in a great tribulation. And so we can go on and on about all this, and I'm not going to do it right now. But this is what Jesus says in Luke 21, 36. Keep alert at all times and pray that you may be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. <laughs> Isn't that encouraging? Let's go to lunch with that one. In reality, folks, it could get a lot worse, but be encouraged. Why? Because we ultimately win in the end. The greatest growth of the church does not come during peace. It comes during persecution. Church in China is exploding with growth because of persecution. It's, it really, it, it's amazing what happens to persecution. Am I, do I want persecution? No. What's, what, should be our, what should your job and my job be? Our job should be to pray, for the peace of Jerusalem, obviously. We should also and help our government to be on the right side of things. We should tell, call our senators and congressmen, hey, this ain't good what's happening here, right? We should stand up for truth. We should love the Arabs and the Muslims because they need God, all right? But we should be doing everything we can to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ because a day is coming where this is gonna begin to happen. It could be tomorrow. It could be 10 years from now. It could happen in 2047. I don't know. But be ready. The prophetic calendar has never been like it is now today. Can you see at least what I've showed you today? That we indeed could very well be the last generation. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up, please. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 12, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Now, should we all start stockpiling um, freeze-dried food and get guns and all that kind of thing and get ready for the end? I don't know. I think we need to be prepared. For example, if a storm comes, you've got to be prepared. I think it's wise to see the signs of the times and prepare yourself for it. But more importantly, it's more important that you prepare yourself spiritually. That you make sure your heart is in the right place. And yes, it would be wise to prepare. And I believe this. I really do believe God's going to speak to his church, not just to one segment of the church. God's going to speak to all people, people that believe in him. God's going to speak to different segments of the body of Christ. You're going to start hearing a universal uh, saying, yes, he's coming soon. People that really love Jesus Christ and know Christ. And you're beginning to hear those voices. So we should be ready because the time is coming. Time is coming. 
Let's pray. Father, I, I want to thank you so much for the scriptures that just illuminate what's happening today. Lord, it's absolutely astounding that indeed we could be the last generation, Father, that we believe that could very well be the case. Lord, we want to be aware of the times and seasons that we're in. Lord, I pray that we would get ourselves ready, Father, that we would not become complacent, that we would not just hide and wait for you to come back, but Lord, that we'd be extra, extra vigilant, Lord, be extra um, wanting to reach people with the truth that the time is coming, the end of history is coming, and we have to do the best we can to spread your love around the world, around the block, and around the office, and around the table. God, I ask that you would give us a love and a grace. And Father, I also pray that we would do our job as citizens of the United States of America, that we would do our best to be good citizens and pray and, and vote and call our representatives and let them know what's going on in respect and dignity. Lord, bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you a question today. You know, this is a lot of scary stuff. Are, are you ready to meet God? If you were to die today, are you absolutely sure that you'd be with Jesus? Well, I'm a pretty good person. The Bible says there's only one way to heaven. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can believe in Christ all you want, but until you give your life to him, say, you're, you're mine. I give my life to you. You're not really a believer. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to just, just quickly, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to sing a, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me. I'm going to pray a prayer. If you'd pray this with the bottom of your heart and believe what, I'm, what you're praying in your heart, today can be a new day of salvation for you. Lord Jesus, I'm pray in your own quiet heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, the sins I'm, I'm aware of and the sins I'm not. I give my life to you today. I declare my life is not my own. I live for you. Fill me with your love and your strength to walk the path you have for me. In Jesus' name. Amen. With every head bowed, you can say, just real quickly, if you can say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer for the first time or I, I made a recommitment. Can I just see a quick show of hands? Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Come on, just, I need a couple here. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you for being honest. Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, in your, in your bulletin, there's a little card. There's a little uh, connection card. On the, on the front of it, it says, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior for the first time. If you want to just fill that out and put it in one of the, the boxes or come up, I'm gonna, uh, come up to one of the prayer team, share with someone what you did today. We have a special gift for you. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. Prayer team, make your way up as we close with this last song. And uh, if you need prayer for anything at all, we want to encourage you to come forward. If you sign that today, I'm going to ask you to fill that out. Put it in one of the boxes. We'll contact you. We'll help you out with this process of a new beginning, okay?